Hey, it's the Stick Figure Historian again, and this is episode 39 of the England series. It was fast becoming clear to all that the Battle of Naseby was a blow from which King Charles could not easily recover. If ever. All that was left to him now were Oxford, Wales, and a few territories in the middle of England called the Midlands. Parliament was thrilled. The Scots, not so much. The talk in Westminster was increasingly in favor of English policies, and even of doing away with the old idea of a king entirely. Meaning, the Covenanter dream of a Presbyterian government was not looking very likely. They decided it was time to act on their own and start exploring other options. Perhaps Charles would work a deal with them. The Scots turned to an old ally of their country, France. And the particular man they turned to in France was Cardinal Mazarin. Yes, Mazarin was a cardinal, a Catholic churchman. Why the staunchly Protestant Scottish Covenanters would even briefly consider having dealings with Mazarin is something that I can't explain. It's really quite strange. Whatever the reasoning, the Scots were appealing to Mazarin to help them ensure that King Charles would be set properly back on the throne again. Mazarin responded in friendly terms, sending a priest, Jean de Montreal, to London in August that year to help with the negotiations. Summer passed, then fall, each season with its share of small battles and skirmishes all over England's war-torn soil, until at last November came and Charles laid his sword to rest once more for the winter in Oxford. Things were looking increasingly hopeless. Rupert was gone. Many of his officers were gone. The main part of his army was captured or dead. Charles needed reinforcements come spring, or there was no way he could go on fighting. He sent a message to Wales, his last remaining resource in terms of manpower. Whilst the king awaited a reply, a stranger appeared in his court. A visitor from France, one Jean de Montreal. The Frenchman explained that he had come to act as a mediator between King Charles and the Scots. He told the king that the Scots were on his side, and that they would take him into their protection, under the condition he would just deliver himself up to them, and agree to uphold their solemn league and covenant. Charles declined and sent Montreal back to London. There was no way he was going to abolish Anglicanism. He wasn't that desperate. Not yet. But he did keep this bit of information tucked in the back of his head for the future. He had been trying for a while now to turn the Scots against his English foes. Here was a sign that there was some discord brewing that he could perhaps use to his advantage. Another visitor stopped by Oxford that winter. This one no stranger. It was Rupert. He had decided not to go to Venice after all, and had come back to make peace with his uncle. The two made up, and Charles was glad of his help in preparing for the challenges of the coming 1646 campaign. That spring, the Welsh responded, alighting from their mountains and setting their steps east to meet the king's summons. They made it to Stow-on-the-Wolds, about 28 miles from Oxford, but no further. They were attacked there by the Roundheads and defeated. The remains of Charles' reinforcements were now prisoners of war. And it soon seemed that it would not be long before a similar fate befell the king himself, for now Fairfax and Cromwell were coming to Oxford, and there could only be one intent in that. The Roundheads were making for the kill, and as the reports continued to come in of their progress, Charles began to feel quite desperate. There was no conceivable way Oxford was going to withstand a siege. He remembered Montreal's message from the Scots. Perhaps it was time to consider the option. He was tired of fighting, tired of running. He had little to no army left. At least with the Scots, he had a chance of being safe. They didn't completely hate him. 
wasn't their country his country? The land of his birth? It was almost as if the French ambassador could read the king's thoughts, for Montreal now wrote again to Oxford. This time, he had an even greater proclamation. The Scots have all agreed, in the name of His Majesty Louis the Fourteenth of France, to accept you as their rightful king. All that you must do is deliver yourself up to them. So he said. But there were a few problems with this. For one thing, the King of France really had no business backing any promises that the Scots made. <clears throat> Not to mention, he was currently only seven years old. Now, granted, I shortened Montreal's words a bit. His mother was also included in the promise as a regent. But still, ridiculous. And talk about ridiculous. This kid seriously looks like a girl. Although, it's a little better than this portrait of her, uh, I, I mean him. Or this one of him posing with his brother. I don't know, they're all pretty terrible. I mean seriously, here's a picture of his future daughter. And the only real difference is she's wearing a dress. I guess at least he didn't wear a dress. <sighs> Oh wait, never mind. Well, okay, I guess a lot of babies wore dresses back then. That didn't keep up when he grew up. Mostly, anyway. Uh, but we're getting sidetracked here. Point is, what in the world does the French king have to do with making Scottish bargains? And for another thing, the Scots had never actually made this promise at all. Montreal had misinterpreted and changed a few ambiguous things the Scots had told him and made his own bad judgments, or lies, based off of them. And it would seem this was not the first time in the Frenchman's career of mediator that he had pulled this kind of business. Apparently, he had been misrepresenting and twisting several promises and statements in his dealings between the Scots, the English Presbyterians, and the King. And none of them had been exactly honest with Montreal either. The result was a triple knotted web of confusion and discord. Montreal never really helped anything or anyone.